So moving on to our last and final speaker, um, I want to invite Mr. Doug Reese to come up. Doug is the owner of the Mid-State Milling, uh, Mid Milling and State Center, which he's owned since 2003. He entered the feed business directly after graduation from the University of Northern Iowa. You can come over here, Doug. There's steps over here, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So he entered the feed business directly after graduation from the University of Northern Iowa, where he played football for the Panthers. In 2017, he purchased the feed mill in Buckeye, Iowa. Mid-state uh, milling makes feed for beef, dairy, and swine operations, with swine being the largest at 2,500 tons per week. The mill sells some bag poultry and goat feed as well. Additionally, Doug works with nutritionists to develop and sell Mill, Mill State Milling Elite Show Pig Feed. Doug, his wife, and three daughters live in Zeering, Iowa, where he has some Duroc and Spot Sows. So welcome. Thank you. Awesome. So um, can you start, so coming from the feed mill perspective, we've heard from the extension veterinarian, someone that's gone through the audit directly. Have you been involved in a VFD audit? We've had uh, both the FDA and the state Iowa Department of Ag. Is your microphone on? Slide it. Is it? Okay, perfect. Sorry. Sorry. Just wanted to make sure. We have been involved with both the FDA and the state of Iowa coming in. Uh, they were just preliminary audits, um, mainly looking through our records. And, uh, and like Pete, Dr. Schneider said, uh, an educational process. They're truly out there to try to help educate to start with. Um, back when the FDA first decided to regulate VFDs, they, uh, I had a lot of interaction with a lot of my peers, a lot of friends that are veterinaries in the field. And they actually were coming to me and go, what do we do? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were used to, hey, I can tell you to inject 10 cc's to this sow or give a shot to this pig or water medicate, but they weren't familiar with the dosages and the regulations on the, on the feed medicated side. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them had never really truly looked through or read a uh, feed compendium. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our regulations as a feed mill to, to have it on staff, have it on the shelf, and be able to follow those mixing guidelines. That's part of a medicated feed mill. So it, it's been a very good learning curve for both myself and the local veterinarians to work together at this and get through this process because we know it's coming. We have to. Um, you know, it, it's food and not feed anymore. Yeah. Okay. So can you walk me through the process of filling a, a VFD? So we've talked about kind of the rule comes down from the veterinarian, whether they submit it hard copy electronically. How do you handle it from there? Um, well, no offense to any veterinarian, but typically we're getting a feed order before the script shows up. Okay. So the order <laughs> okay. is on hold. Good to know that. Okay. <laughs> when it comes into our office, the order is on hold, whether it's sent electronically or um, called in through the phone. The order gets put on hold until that script comes in to match with it. Okay. And then once the script comes in from uh, a global vet link, uh, I, get, I still get a lot of handwritten ones, believe it or not. Okay that are filled out. We have several integrators that we deal with that have their own system like Dr. Schneider has. We actually get some through his um, programming, which works very well. Um, so once that, once that uh, VFD comes in, we attach that to the order. The order gets placed as scripted there. I review because uh, I'm very responsible for how it is. I kind of feel like we're a pharmacist uh, yeah. dosing out mm -hmm. the medication. And I, I personally look over every script to make sure that it's filled out properly. Um, I started that from day one in 2017, but as I had these audits from the state and the FDA regulators, they also, I asked the question, who, who's liable if we fill the script wrong? And uh, unfortunately, the, the mill that fills the script wrong is the one liable and not the, the person, fill, not the doctor filling the script out. Now, they will go back and talk to the doctor also for that, but if something happens, if something's not right, we're the ones that are going to get uh, in trouble for filling that script wrong. So, in kind of piggybacking off of that last statement in terms of liability, um, so if, say, you have you found any, like, minor errors or something that maybe 
do you have to call? What would what would be your step if you find found an error there? Um, if if it's incorrectly sent, usually my first call is is to the veterinary that you sent it, because um, yeah. I need to visit with him and say, you know, this I can't fill this script. Number one, mm -hmm. how can we work together at getting where you want to want want it to go? Um, as an example, there's one out there uh, that comes in a lot, uh, lincomycin. Okay. Uh, it's 100 grams of lincomycin you can feed for 21 days only. Well, some of the scripts are filled 100 grams of lincomycin for 183 days or 165 days. Well, I can't fill that script writ written like that. Right. Interesting. Because it's 21 days. And what I do is I go back to the feed compendium and look up the actual FDA, and you can look it up on the website also on what the requirements are. Okay. So it sounds like you're doing your due diligence as you're feeding, it, filling it, these VFDs. It, it's very, uh, it's been a very educational process for us as, as mills. Have you, do you give any feedback to the veterinarians that you've worked with or? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I know a couple of them real well, and we and we uh, we once a month get together and and just visit about it. And That's sometimes cool. I've been, he says, "Hey, do you have the one veterinary that I get along with real well?" Well, I get along with all of them. No offense, but <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, uh, we we go over it. You know, he and the hardest thing is the one thing on the scripts, and I don't mean to jump around on you, but mm -hmm. it's just sticking in my mind what Dr. Rademacher brought up is the bovine side of it. And I know this, we're talking about swine today. Um, the bovine side of the scripts are the ones that I'm having to probably call and, and ask about 99% of the time. Okay. They're well, the hardest ones to fill. <laughs> so that's good for us in the yes. swine industry, for it, sure. It, it's a little more clear cut <laughs> on the swine industry, yes. Perfect. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about kind of the, the auditing process, <clears throat> what that looks like for you, and what your experience has been? What our experience has been. Mm -hmm. um, from the Iowa Department of Ag, the, the individual that audited us, first of all, he wanted to come in and, and we have to keep a file of the scripts, whether it's electronically or whether it's a hard copy, mm -hmm. and we do both. Um, okay. uh, the ones that are electronically, we're able to save in files, and the hard copies we're able to keep in a file also, but we print those off so they're all in one file. Um, he, wants me to, he wants to see my files, so he'll pull them out, he'll open it, and he'll pull one out here, and on that, what we've done from a feed mill standpoint, since every batch of feed has, a, has its own individual lot number, uh -huh. we have to pull that, go back to our records of, of billing process, and we pull up all our production records. They want to make sure that and see how many pounds we actually mixed in that batch of feed. Okay. Um, from then, then, then we go to the next step, which is the billing side of it, invoicing side, to see if that has been billed out properly and that the script is actually attached to the invoice. Because they they don't know whether we've actually sent it to the farm or not if we don't have that attached to their invoice. Okay. But we take it one step farther. We're attaching a, a script also to the delivery ticket as it goes out to the farm. So hopefully at some point the producer can always call us, mm -hmm. get another copy of it if they don't have it. Okay. But at least it's somewhere. Yeah. Hopefully they have access to it. Perfect. Were there any frustrations associated with the, the audit itself? Was it time consuming? We heard an hour from. I would say about an hour. Okay. Um, you know, the hardest part is is making sure that, you know, it opened our eyes. We had everything there, but then you know we went back and did a self audit later on, and sometimes uh, one of us forgot to staple it to the invoice. You know, if we would have pulled mm -hmm. that one on accident, they mm -hmm. would have saw that and said, "Hey, you got to do a better job." Okay. Um, time consuming. I would say the most frustrating part was uh, of the whole VFD process was in 2017 not having producers upset with me that I won't fill their, you know, okay. hey, I've gotten 400 grams of CTC in our swine feed for years. Mm -hmm. Why can't I just get that? Why do I have to have a script? Well, I had to pull out all the information, the new regulations, you know. This is why I can't fill this script. I'm going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. We can't do this anymore. And I think uh, National Pork Producers has done a great job of, of educating the, it came so fast, I think we've done a lot of education in the last two years. Yeah, definitely, definitely. On the process. Yeah, and that's one of the things I should say at the National Pork Board that we tried to track was how many producers were calling us 
for information on that. So it's good to know that, you know, that folks are reaching out. They're probably reaching out to ISU, to their veterinarian, to other resources. So there's tons of resources out there for our producers. So thank you so much for, for joining us for this panel. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in the hour. So I wanted to open it up to you guys to ask questions. Um, we have a catch box in the back to, to make it a little more interactive, have some enrichment here. Um, for those who have never used the uh, catch box, it's so you're not scary. It, it's a big, it looks like a big box, but it's essentially a lavalier, one of the clip-on mics inside of styrofoam box. So um, we're going to toss it at you, not directly at your head, but we'll toss it at you. So only underarms, please, underarming the, the catch box. Um, but if you have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand. It saves time of running around and trying to pass the mic. Um, and again, it just makes it a little more fun and interactive. So do you guys have any questions for my panelists here? Toss it. <laughs> Perfect. Now speak into the top. Perfect. Okay, sure. I, I deal with contract growers and what records do they need on on a, as a contract finisher on the farm as far as VFDs go? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. Uh, that one is on that document that I referenced. We did ask that question. And I think the, the primary thing that they want to be able to do is be able to produce that document uh, when, when and if they would actually come to that site as part of that inspection process. So if that's something they can pull up online or that the home office can fax a copy to them, what I've seen most production systems will do is they'll just go ahead and print a hard copy and leave it at the site in, in case of an inspection. But there's nothing in the, in the rules or regulations that says it has to be that way. They just have to be able to reproduce that document upon request upon a site visit okay thanks yeah I went through a common swine industry audit and we just went to the feed mill and got it so yeah thanks yep other questions I believe Let's start up here this is probably for everybody from your own viewpoint but um, starting back with Heather's presentation and you note noted where antibiotic use has gone down and at least what I took from yours was you insinuated that that's that means it's successful my question for everybody is what's a measure of success in this process so that's a great question um, I apologize if I gave the inclination that the the indication that reduction is like a, that we're, we're going for a race to zero that is not the case in any way shape or form as a public health veterinarian I promote stewardship not just reduce use Right now, unfortunately, um, the sales data, as uh, both Chris and I have pointed out, on our sales does not equal on-farm use. And so what we at the Port Board are looking at, those stewardship activities that I pointed out, we're looking at how to build a stewardship program, how to evaluate that stewardship program. And right now we're still trying to explore what a metric looks like. FDA is trying to figure that out as well. Um, in some ways, you know, reduced use could be an outcome, but it's not the measure that we're focusing on. We want to make sure, again, the right drug for the right bug, right duration. Um, so. Thanks for the opportunity to clarify. I apologize. Yeah, that is, that's a great question. I would follow up with that just to say, I think what it really forced producers to do is to have those frank conversations with their veterinarians. Because I can think of ones, you know, there's ones like, God, Dad always fed 40 grams of Thailand and finishing, and like as a growth brand, I got to keep that, right? Well, I'll tell you, just for, I had the ability in my previous two positions to Iowa State, uh, we did a fair amount of research on growth promoters in, you know, fully slatted buildings. And more often than not, we saw absolutely no response with those. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the changing dynamics. You go into three-site production, all in, all out. They get washed every time, you know, compared to leaving them on, you know, the, you know a partial slat or, you know, a f open flush gutter where they can, you know, they have access to their own feces. Getting the feces away, even from a growth promotion standpoint, I think there's value there. I know uh, I referenced a survey that Dr. Schultz and I did earlier, and one of the questions going into it is, what are you going to about growth promotion and the majority of the veterinarians responded well we're just going to switch over to the non-medically important antibiotics well we went back and repeated that survey a year later after the new regs uh, had been implemented and the predominant answer was well guess what we took it out 
and it's fine, right? So I think what's been good and what I think we'll see, in, and I think the story that we can tell is, is, yep, we did stewardship, right? We looked at it. We, we feel like now we've done a better job than maybe what we had in the past. And, and, you know, personally, then I think as soon as they start talking about the race to zero or, you know, wanting to talk more about prevention, then there, there's going to be a very hard line that will be drawn there. You know, the growth promotion, you know, it's like, yep, maybe we don't need it. We can give that up. That probably doesn't really threaten animal health and well-being. Being. Anything beyond that, we're going to have issues in that uh, in that process. So I think it was a good thing to say. Yep, yeah, that forced us to have that conversation. And I think you know we responded and said, "Hey, places where we thought we had to use, maybe we don't have to use it anymore." Just challenge some of those really old paradigms. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree fully with what, what Chris is saying from a veterinarian perspective. It's it's definitely allowed me to have you know I guess more. I'm not sure what the right, right word is, but I guess more input into my, my growers' decisions on their antibiotic treatment choices. I, and really, it's, it's been a great um, opportunity to go there, and, and, and maybe those were conversations I even had before 2017 about, yeah, I'm not sure what the value is of this to you. And when they start to look at the amount of money that they may be saving in the course of a year from not using those antibiotics, you know, then it actually makes me look maybe a little bit better about you know, having had that conversation previously. And, can gain some trust with some growers that maybe again before you weren't as involved with so you know again definitely um, I think from overall you know antibiotic stewardship then um, you know I maybe get on their farm a little bit more maybe we make better decisions on even the water and injectable decisions as well Can Doug answer that while she's sure. taking Sure. Um, just real quick, from a feed mill standpoint, I've seen the same thing as what they just said. A lot of people would put 40 grams of Tylen in, growth promoting, or 100 and then the 40. Um, still have ileitis problems after that. Uh, we've seen a lot less ileitis problems by having the vets more involved now, like Dr. Snyder said, and actually not using Tylen at all in a lot of these. That's probably been the one that. Uh, I honestly probably in all the tons that we make we go through 50 to 70 VFD scripts a week um, I get one tile in a month period I would say most of them are chlorotetracycline so yes uh, it's been a better relationship for the veterinaries with the clients well since we only get one more question I'm gonna make it two pronged <laughs> <laughs> um, so this question is both for um, at the feed mill and at the producer from an audit standpoint. Um, Dr. Schneider, you mentioned that timing is being really scrutinized in the audits. Um, if it's an indication of a 14-day use or a 21-day use or a 28-day use. Um, are you policing the amount of feed that is being delivered on that script? and what kind of feed and how big that pig is so that you know that the filling the script with the amount of feed that you're filling it is getting the right amount of feed for that indication for use and then from the audit standpoint for the producer what's day one is it the day that the feed goes in the bin or the day that the slide gets open and is there any documentation of that sorry <laughs> yeah I mean again that's from, from my experience with that's the hard one to gauge as to what I, I do think that the FDA truly wants to know when the feed's hitting the bin uh, or hitting the hitting the, the, the feeders right but again I may have a guy that opens a, uh, a slide for the new bin but I've already got enough feed in that feeder on a uh, you know a 20 pound pig that it's gonna take me another two days before that feeders even empty so I, I think that's gonna be the, the toughest one to police I, I think I'm not sure how the FDA is doing it today but I mean, I can tell you that the majority of my producers probably, if they, they wanted to get down to it and say it's got to be 14 days and you got to have great documentation of 14 days exactly at the pig's mouth, I'm probably not going to be able to prove that for the majority of my producers. Yeah, I would just make the comment. That's the one thing that I've heard uh, from from the one of the persons from my dolls who's probably going to wind up doing a bunch of these inspections because that's probably not something routine on a finishing barn card is. You know, they, he said, hey, if you can just put date started and date ended, you know, like that's probably not routinely on there, but he, he said going forward, I would make sure I have that on there because that will be one of the ways you can say, yep, here's what it was, here's when I started, here's when I finished sort of deal. All the, all the scripts that we receive have the amount of pigs that are on the script, and that script could be for 
we have a producer that has, say, six sites, as an example. He'll have all six sites on there for the nursery pigs going in. Um, we have to, from our inspected, uh, from the Idaho Department of Ag and the FDA, um, on that script, we're writing down how many tons and what day we take that. Now, the, the most open-ended question is, is how many pounds a day does that pig really eat? That's the hardest thing that I don't think anybody has been able to really answer. We know from a feed standpoint that that pig's going to eat very little when he starts. So what gram level is truly what that pig should be getting? Because it's supposed to be like Kohler tetracycline, 10 milligrams per pound of body weight. So where does the veterinary fill that script at realistically? Because that pig might eat a half a pound in the first week, first two or three days, and that's it. And then all of a sudden they start ramping up to where 14 days later they're eating a pound a day, as an example. So that's the hardest thing we've struggled with from the feed side. And do you experience that you're delivering some of those nursery stage diets long before the pigs are being presented with the feed? Yes, we, uh, we typically, since we're taking the first pellet of diet to, the, to most of the farms, if we can get the script and if we can get the orders in in time, they're there probably two to three days before the pigs arrive. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be there and be a cause of another health issue, so we're, we're in and out of there before that pig arrives. Awesome. Well, thank you all for staying late this afternoon to hang out with us and talk about the Veterinary Feed Directive. I think some of the speakers may hang around for a little bit if you still have some pressing questions. But thank you again for joining us.